What is threatening our, the forage fish in our ocean is simply a unlimited greed. It's unlimited, the, the idea that we have to grab and to, to reduce, to, 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 into, to turn into product everything that is there. And we do this uh, uh, without much reflection. For example, in BC, the herring is turned into fish meal, into food pellets for the aquaculture industry, though far more jobs are maintained by the whale watching industry, by the tourist industry in general. So it is, it is one could say even stupid, uh, to, to think of them as a product without thinking of the services that they, that they can uh, render for us. If you think of a, a food web or a food chain, there's the bottom of the, of the web, which is the plankton, so zooplankton and phytoplankton, and that is the food for everything up higher up on the chain. So the next stage up on the chain um, would be the forage fish. The whales, the, the sea lions, the, the large salmon cannot feed directly on, on small plankton, but they can feed on, on, on forage fish. You have lots of plankton, Different, of different uh, species uh, or different type, and you have lots of predators, large predators, and you have only a few forage fish one, that are a few species of forage fish that are one. crucial to transforming this uh, this bounty into something that uh, the upper trophic level can eat. The the large predators. Well, you know, I'm I'm certainly not a biologist or scientist, but the ones I've talked to say it's the it's the bedrock, you know, of, of our ecosystem. You know, without forage fish, I mean, we know just when it comes to herring, for example, uh, it's primary diet for Chinook, lingcod, halibut, uh, our shorebirds, humpback whales, uh, northern southern resident killer whales all have herring as a keystone part of their diet. So without herring, it's going to have a huge impact on our whole ecosystem. It's, what's interesting is that for some forage fish, we have really good data that numbers are declining things like herring. We have other forage fish, we actually don't know how many we have. We don't know the, the principle of the bank account. And so we, one, if you, want to, if you want to make withdrawals out of a bank account, you better know how much you have in there as principles. A surf smell, for example, we need to know what's the biomass out there and what can we withdraw at a safe level. Say herring, we may want to stop some harvest that's going on. Um, for other ones, we may want to protect all of the beaches where they know where they're spawning and take care of those beaches because we know if they don't reproduce, we're not going to have them in future years. So there's a whole bunch of different things and that's what makes it challenging. Sometimes we want just one simple solution. So Project Watershed is a nonprofit stewardship society um, located here in the Comox Valley. Project Watershed recently started a three-year forage fish research project and kind of the overarching goal of this project is to identify key forage fish habitats in the Northern Salish Sea. So we're trying to identify spawning habitats, bearing habitats, as well as kind of hot spots of forage fish feeding activity so that we can identify these areas and map them out and then use those and kind of that information in conservation and management decisions. So citizen scientists are um, community members who are interested in contributing to scientific research and they're really essential for helping projects like our Forage Fish Project, um, helping us collect meaningful scientific data to help move forward our research program. First we have to sort of figure out where the suitable sediment is, is on that particular day because it changes a lot actually. Some things will change depending on the tide and depending on the weather so, because it's biased sampling. So once we've figured out the, the best place, the, the place that's most likely for the Pacific Sandlands to have laid their eggs, um, then we set up a, a 30 meter transect. And then we start to collect our, our sample. So after we collect the samples from the beach, um, we bring them back to the office typically is where we set up this system. And what it is, it's an essentially kind of a, a reverse gold panning system. So instead of looking for, or instead of trying to extract the large heavy material, we want to extract the light material because the light material in our sample is what the eggs will likely be attached to. So it's essentially kind of like a spinning um, bucket of water and we slowly put our sample into it. And as the water spins, the lightest material comes out and goes through a hole in the middle and ends up in a sieve at the bottom. That's what we're, where the eggs would be if they were present. In order to identify the eggs, you need to look at them um, under the microscope. The eggs are so small 
they are um, attached to either a single grain of sand if they're a surf smelt egg or a, um, have multiple grains of sand attached to them if they're a Pacific Sandlands egg. So when we bring them back to the lab, um, we need those microscopes in order to tell what species they are and be able to count how many eggs there are in a sample. So basically when we get our field sample, we just want to take a little bit, put it in a petri dish, and then we usually add some water or just use some of the ethanol that's already in solution. And without the water, it makes everything almost impossible to see under the microscope. You want to just shake it into a nice smooth layer and put it on the microscope. And usually you start on one side and you just sure. keep track of what you've done and then just keep rotating. Work through the sample looking for a nice round um, egg. Sometimes they float. It can take a while sometimes, but you definitely get used to it and it goes faster. And just do a nice circular motion so you cover the whole plate. So um, one of the big um, kind of research and data gaps that we have in the Northern Salish Sea is that we don't really know where, um, where these important habitats are for, for forage fish. So um, there's kind of a general lack of information on the location and timing of spawning events for Pacific sandlance and surf smelt. And a lot of great work has been done over the past few years, but we're really trying to hone in and, and create maps that show the timing and location of these habitats so that we can better protect and restore. Um, these species. Primarily the issues we're concerned about with spawning is what's happening to the beaches. So things like herring who go near shore to spawn, things like surf smelt, things like sand lance, when they're going into a beach and they're laying their eggs on that beach, if we don't take care of that beach, then they're not going to have a place to go. The concept that's difficult for people is if you lose one small beach, that's not a big deal. There's a lot of other beaches. But if we don't have a systematic way to protect and take care of these beaches, ultimately it will be the death by a thousand cuts because we're going to lose all of this critical spawning habitat. Often we get a little bit too focused on sort of higher up in the, the food chain or the larger species and not always do we look at, okay, these kind of little forage fish that nobody really pays attention to, but now once we started looking at something we do care a lot about, like the salmon population, it's like, okay, what might be going on? We're here on Demon Island, um, are the communities of Hornby and Demon Island are coming out to strongly support the, the herring movement to let the herring live. Four out of the five North Pacific herring runs have crashed and we're here to create a flotilla in uh, Lambert Channel uh, at the northern tip of the Salish Sea to show the rest of Canada and British Columbia and coastal people that this has to stop. There has to be an end to the commercial fisheries and protect this keystone species. Let the herring live! Let the herring live! Let the herring live! Imagine if you have a fishery uh, such as we have in the, in the Strait of Georgia that is relentless and uh, a big fishery then it can reduce it to nothing. And at that point, the stock might not recover or will need decades to recover, and that happens. Because uh, the small fish, uh, they, they are protected by schooling, but they, if there are not many of them, they cannot form schools. So um, the fact that they, they are easy to catch is not a reason to catch them. If we continue to see, to see declines in forage fish, I think we're just going to keep seeing impacts higher and higher up the, the food chain and um, more species aren't going to have very much to eat. There's going to be less fish for us to eat and um, the whole marine food web will kind of 
collapse. There's so many things that eat the forage fish. So you can imagine if that population of organisms somehow declines or, or is unhealthy, that population, everything above it is going to suffer. Well, I think the whole ecosystem is really at stake when you think about that. If you have a species like forage fish that takes plankton, converts it into nutrients that other animals can, can use, and that disappears, well, you're going to have a whole shrinkage of the ecosystem overall. We have to look at what the value is of keeping that fish in the water for those higher value fisheries like salmon or tour operators that depend on, you know, uh, reliable uh, northern and southern resident killer whales. And then, of course, the right thing to do, you know, maintaining that we protect those ecosystem species that don't have a voice. That's, that's our role as leaders and as community members. Uh, and without our ecosystem, we don't have economy. Uh, economy. We're, we're coastal communities, uh, you know, uh, our fish is our food security, it's our economy, it's our culture, it's our way of life. So when you cut, take out the, the fundamental bedrock species, you don't have an economy. My hopes for the future of our oceans is that um, we think about how our actions and how the decisions that we make impact um, the whole ecosystem as a whole. And we're not just thinking about one species or um, one a fishery, we're thinking about how everything is connected and how um, the deci decisions that we make um, on the ground um, impact the whole food web. Well, if we don't take a, you know, action now, I'm really concerned about the fate of our oceans. We have a big battle. We, we're seeing a acidification of our ocean, warming oceans. They're under immense threat, whether it be transportation, pollution, uh, uh, the impact of you know previous uh, overfishing, and certainly now, right now, when it comes to some species, um, the the threat of species that are you know near extinction or, or threatened uh, for extinction. We're seeing runs vanish right before our eyes here on the coast. We just had the lowest return in recorded history of the Fraser River sockeye. We saw runs get decimated in the Skeena in Clockwood. And I don't know what it's going to take for the federal government to sound the alarm bells and to invest in coastal restoration in habitat protection into uh, climate adaptation and mitigation strategies. But we need the government to come up with a, an emergency package for, for coastal British Columbia to, to conserve and protect our, our delicate ecosystem where everything is interconnected. Uh, and and uh, so we're, we're calling on the government to do that. And if we don't get that, I'm, I'm very worried about the future of our e sensitive ecosystem. Uh, the predator that depend on this, uh, on this fish will themselves uh, uh, be endangered. Uh, so the herring and all these animals that contribute to beautiful British Columbia will be gone. And uh, then we can shorten the thing to, which is Colombia, because the beautiful part will not be there.